So this is the seventh international conference of crisis mappers. And this is really special for us today because this is actually the first time it's being held in Asia. And especially uh, with host country, the Philippines here in Manila, with my organization, MAPPH. In uh, 2013, I was honored to have been chosen to be a Google USAID and ICT for Peace fellow and attended my first ICCM in Nairobi. And that was a really special time as well because it was Super Typhoon Haiyan happening at the same time. And many of us will never forget what happened that year. I did want to acknowledge all our wonderful volunteers, our staff, and all the folks who supported us during the disaster experience. And I also wanted to actually acknowledge all the online viewers who were re mapping remotely. And for folks in the room, can I just if you could just stand up if you were involved in the Typhoon Haiyan crisis response, if I could just acknowledge. Please, let's give them a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. The crisis mapper community is about 10,000 folks all around the world and it continues to grow. I did want to welcome also the ICCM organizing team who have traveled more than 24 hours to be here today, so thank you very much to Melissa, to Jackie, to Bill, Gracie, and Jay, and our local staff here who are supporting us as well. So, here we go. So, oh, <laughs> here we go. So first of all, why the Philippines? So the Philippines is a very unique place. We have 7, 000, over 7,100 islands here. We have 81 provinces. We have eight languages and 11 different ethnicities. We are spread over such a vast geography and a very diverse culture. We've had over 300 years of Spanish colonization and 50 years of American rule as well. And part of that brings along these trade routes and these influences. Many people don't know that with the Spanish galleon trade, Mexican silver was brought into Manila, here, right here in Manila, to purchase luxury goods from China. And through that migratory route, the influence of Philippine sailors going abroad to other countries has implanted our Filipino heritage in other uh, cultures around the world. So our unique uh, cuisine, our kinilao, our lambanog, our tuba, which may be known to you as uh, famous influences in South America as ceviche or as tequila. Um, even our mangoes and coconuts um, were brought over into South America and those actually originated here in the Philippines. So these migratory routes really influence and shape our culture. They influence our perspective. And 300 years later, now that we have the ability to actually digitize and map these influences, um, it's even more of an impact that we can measure and account. Oh, here we go again. So we have a population of 100 million Filipinos and 10 million Filipinos abroad as well, with challenges that we have with urban infrastructure, urban planning, disaster risk, poverty, and corruption. We have many of these different challenges. Essentially everything that you have for the SDGs, we have challenges to that here. And part of that comes with our diverse geography and our diverse peoples. But along with that being the third most disaster risk prone country in the world, as well as Last year, we were the first actually at risk for climate change. We are 13th this year. Our people are remarkably resilient. With the Filipinos that have to work abroad, I'm sure many of our um, guests here have met Filipinos along the way. Um, we have such strong networks in spite of separating families to be able to help feed their families here. Somehow, we managed to be one of the happiest people on Earth. We might be correlated because we also take the most selfies on Earth. Um, but somehow it is embedded in our DNA and so it is appropriate as well that we look at resilience models here in the Philippines. So, so we are here today 
Oops. We are here today in the Bayanihan Center. So Bayanihan, appropriately in Tagalog, in our language here, means community spirit. And quite literally, that community spirit, when you refer to Bayanihan, is when the entire community comes together to help someone move their house to a new location. So they physically take the house and move it to a new location. And there's just the horse there standing there doing nothing. So this center is specifically why we are here today. Why we are here today? Because the Bayanihan Center means a gathering of people. We have people locally, we have people abroad. How many people are here from the government sector? The business sector? NGO? Students? Citizens. Great. <laughs> that, was a, that was a trick question. And how many here are visitors to the Philippines? Great. And folks from Luzon, our northernmost region? Visayas, the center region? And Mindanao? Great. So we have pretty much a, a really great representation from across the sectors, and that's exactly what we need today to figure out the way forward. The new realities of disaster risk and climate change, these amplified risks of conflict due to food security and poverty, they intersect at so many different social challenges and we can no longer do the same thing over and over again. We have to find better ways to physically to work together and mapping is an excellent opportunity to visualize those efforts, to visualize those needs, from across the sector so we can actually better coordinate, provide better transparency, better coordination, and also better civic and community engagement. There are many political things happening around the world today and people feel disengaged through the noise in the community. And we hope to be able to provide a friendlier space, a platform where it's not based on politics and more based on visualizing community needs. And what mapping can really do is visualize the needs of those, the most vulnerable communities, to really place them on the map, to identify their needs to funders, and to help provide um, better resilience through our communities in a scalable way. So now we're moving on to the next session of the program. We have our Making All Voices Count panel. Making All Voices Count is one of our supporters, and they support global work on disaster resilience, open governance, and citizen participation. So Map the Philippines is the project that I'm working on here as part of uh, this panel. We'll describe what we're working on here. And Map the Philippines is a real, a really a way, it's an open source technology that helps provide open data from government, from business, from NGOs, from citizens, um, and from community groups locally and internationally to really visualize needs and understand risk. Our work is really rooted in the sustainable development goals. All these various markers, the 17 metrics of healthy cities. Essentially, this is every single day in the Philippines, there's something going on. You could half joke that it's a disaster every day in the Philippines. Today, we have the remnants of Typhoon Helen. Uh, that caused flood. We were expecting 18 millimeters of rain today, and so thank you very much for braving the floods. So essentially, we're collecting data on all these various metrics to be able to provide a framework for strengthening communities and building local capacity. The core of what we do is based on OpenStreetMap. We've got some wonderful folks from OpenStreetMap. I'm human humanitarian OpenStreetMap here today that'll chat more in depth. But OpenStreetMap is the Wikipedia of maps and it's supported by over three million volunteers. It is free and open source, so the maps are made by the community, for the community, walang bayad. It is free to use, it works offline. So kung walang internet access, okay then, it's built for the Philippines where we have very limited connectivity here. And that's one of the first challenges in working with the Philippines is that we don't have a centralized map. 
We have many, many different challenges. Many people are creating their own maps. For example, for Typhoon Haiyan, um, on the repository for um, humanitarian aid here, there are over 800 maps sliced and diced in various ways, various regions, various sectors. And if we empower everybody to work on one single mapping platform to create that base layer first of our, our houses, our streets, our airports, then we can layer additional data on top of that. But we're not wasting precious resources creating maps that are very limited in, in use and are expensive to use and often inaccurate because of our limited communities. So most of the Philippines really looks like this on OpenStreetMap and on other mapping platforms. If you're a government, if you're an NGO, and you want to invest in Silago Leyte, it's like nothing exists in that town. And this is OpenStreetMap for Manila. This represents the vibrancy and the layers of where we'd like the whole Philippines to be. You can even drill down to the ATM locations here. So you can imagine, not just for disaster response, as that we are shifting this model to a more resilient model so that we can understand where the high priority areas are in the country, what community needs are from a public and private sector perspective, and coordinate and track and monitor those efforts going forward. So we take all these cross sectors working in one community. Our software is on mapph.com. And you're welcome to have a look at our data and also contribute to the platform. So we are both, you can both view data from the various government agencies as well as contribute your own data. You can report as an organization or as an individual to help enrich our maps because we are only as good as our contributors. And the, the value of this is that data is in real time or near real time. Statistics here can take three years or longer. By the time a need is identified by government or private sector, it can take months or years. And meanwhile, our needs are critical in real time. So we can help work with communities and really understand what their local priorities are and then have funders and donors shift to that real time need versus this current model where funders have a limited engagement of community, limited people are able to access those funds or honestly survive the grant application process. And so this is a more real-time way to be able to really directly connect communities directly to funders. So the most vulnerable communities, the most marginalized communities can add their data onto maps and really layering all these data sets so that if you're looking for a community, you do water in Cavite, for example, you can see from government sector who is doing water in Cavite who from the business sector is there, who from the NGO sector is there. So we can then coordinate to mobilize those needs. And when the ine inevitable typhoon, we have 22 this year, every year at least, um, when there's a disaster, when there's a conflict, you're already networked together, you know who the partners are, you can more quickly mobilize, you can share resources. Uh, we have very limited infrastructure here, many two-lane roads, so rather than having empty trucks come back with no goods, you can better coordinate that to deliver other goods. And more importantly, risk. So our different government agencies here have various, uh, their data, very rich data sets as it relates to the SDGs. Food security risk, unemployment, employment, malnutrition, health metrics, crime, uh, violence, um, disaster risk. There's so many rich data sets here. And by layering those risks, so you can imagine we're layering the first layer, which is who is doing what where. From the public sector and the private sector, where are those services located? Secondly, you can layer on top of that, what are the risks in that area? From poverty to food security, um, to unemployment, and gender violence, and so forth. And then the disaster risk as well on top of that. So you can really have a 360 degree view of what that community's priorities are. This is an example of one of the maps that we do. This is uh, a map of the central region in the Philippines coordinating the feeding programs pl plotted against underweight children. So you'll see the bubbles, the largest bubbles designate 12,000 recipients of that feeding program. The smallest blue dots represent 400 recipients. You can see adequate coverage on this eastern coast, but here in Palawan, which is actually where our field visit is for various reasons um, on Monday, you'll see Palawan more than 40% of the children in that community are malnourished. And yet, there are very few feeding programs. So we're not trying to 
um, explain causation or correlation, but this causes us pause to question, is there an under-reporting of feeding programs in that community, or is there a serious critical issue that we need to handle now? This is one of our test provinces where we're layering all the data, so in Samar province, you'll start to see the similar trend. So in libraries in the location, you'll see many more libraries in the lower region near Tacloban, a sprinkling on the northern coast. Hospitals, similar trend. This is data from, collected from UN Ocha for the funding that was during uh, Typhoon Haiyan, Typhoon Yolanda, and these are the education programs that were funded. So you'll see them funded in that central region again. And the livelihood programs in the green sections, again in those same regions. Those are the urbanized areas, but by now you're wondering what that red and orange areas are. That's actually poverty incidence. So how do we better shift knowing that there's high priority areas in those communities? And this is a central map that shows all the previous data sets that I just showed you on one map, where you can really see that overlapping trend in the Tacloban area, coastal trend on top, but largely um, several gaps in communities that have no uh, services or funding. And that concentration of area in the middle is actually the highest in disaster risk and landslide risk in the region. So what does that mean for government, for NGOs, especially for business, where you funded the areas in the most disaster risk prone areas in that community? So we use our maps from Project NOAA, who are also here with us today. And they provide um, these hazard maps that also identify where the safe areas are. Because it's not enough just to show where the dangerous areas are, we need to show where they can go to for safety. So this is just a quick screen grab from the platform of the various layers. I've just selected food security, gender equity, and health. So you can see how layering these various uh, data sets can start to see maybe some trends or further pause to um, better understand where there might be priority areas that need uh, services faster and health as well. So how do we map the Philippines? Our goal is to map all of the 81 provinces create those base layers and start mapping what their local needs are by December of 2017. So what we do is we have mapping parties, and our mapping parties, our mapping training workshops are always free. They're always cross-sector. We always involve students. This is actually our Map PH Kiapo mapping exercise, uh, where over 100 people joined us for a city walk. We're not only helping the heritage protection of this area, but also mapping the fire prevention um, metrics in that community where most of the water, um, most of the fire hydrants and uh, fire response is actually privatized. So trying to be able to see so many heritage areas in this area, if there's a fire in one region, um, what happens to that community and how can we provide better funding to protect our heritage buildings and disaster risk areas. We're very excited to announce that for the first time we will be able to help swipe along and map the Philippines, and you can join along with us. This currently exists online as a free app for both um, iOS and Android, and it's called Map Swipe. We will be placing the Philippines on our very own Map PH Swipe to fast track the mapping of the Philippines, where anybody can take 30 seconds, a minute to learn the tutorial, and then help us start tagging um, different imagery on whether you see a house, whether you see a road, but really to be able to provide that support, tapping into our 10 million Filipinos abroad as well and our global networks to fast track to meet our goals. We're also partnered with a Youth Mappers Network, which is currently 30 university partners around the world. Uh, we have chapters now in the Philippines. Some of our uh, partners are here from University of the Philippines, um, La Salle Benild, as well as Far Eastern University and we hope to spread these networks nationwide. And part of that is to grow our mapping community here, to be able to provide mapping as a livelihood opportunity so we can map our own local assets, not just in times of disasters. We have our partnership with uh, the Humanitarian Information Unit and the US State Department who have been very generous in providing us with free satellite imagery. We are also working on joint uh, bipartisan legislation here that we will be introducing shortly to open up data layers from across the government agencies in the Philippines to be able to complete the mapping that we're doing from across the SDGs and also a faster release of data during times of conflict and emergency to really 
um, help us achieve our goals and be able to help prioritize the needs of communities. We also share our data on open aerial maps, so any free imagery that we have, you're free to use that on a Creative Commons license, so you can access imagery for your community there. And sustainable livelihood. So we have many different challenges here, as I mentioned. What we want to be able to do is help direct our progressive partners to be able to work with our communities here so that they're not having to result to illegal fishing, illegal poaching, mining activities, and really focus on better wages. Most Filipinos here live on 6 to $8 a day. Um, so trying to connect them with better, higher paying local markets as well as international markets. So we're mapping these artisans, our partners that you see outside from our food and beverage to our products. We're helping map all those artisans and their needs to then connect them to more sustainable buying networks. So that's, in essence, map the Philippines. We're asking you to help us, help you. It is free and open source, and we are piloting it here in the Philippines and then making it available to other countries to be able to share this model. So it's a special time here because you can help provide us feedback on how we can make the platform better. We are still in the beta phase of our, our work, and you're more than welcome to um, also start using elements of it in your communities. Um, so our hashtag is MapPH if you want to follow along as well as we do these various trainings. We are doing trainings in Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao. We'll start opening up um, under missing maps as well, the tasking manager for the mappers, uh, for folks to really help us populate the maps all around uh, the priority areas in the Philippines. So right now our priority areas are uh, Mindanao, Palawan, and Samar for high-risk food security issues, knowing that food security intersects poverty, um, access to reliable, affordable, and nearby food. That's a real challenge here in the Philippines. Many people cannot afford to buy vegetables um, because of the local imports that are not as nutritious and priced much lower. Um, and for livelihood, being able to map better livelihoods so they can feed their families, nutrition education um, to really address serious health issues and malnutritious, malnutrition issues that we find are not necessarily correlated with poverty. So all these are coming together to be able to really provide this integrated approach and a more real-time approach. And by visualizing it on a map, you can really track the status of projects. If you have data sets, you can put them on the site, and that way you're not going and doing the needs assessment, you're not doing the survey, you're not going into the communities and spending those valuable resources when there's a very good chance another organization has already done that. So we want to help people save their money and we also want to be able to help people work better together and address the needs of our most vulnerable communities.